Welcome everyone to the Partnerships Intention to Action Clinic, which today is focused on energy. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Jacob and I'm the Communications and Partnership Manager at the Partnership. Um, and it's really lovely to see all your faces. We've muted um, your lines for now, but everyone's going to get the chance to chat to each other when we um, move into smaller groups later on. But please do introduce yourself in the chat. Um, and as I said at the start, it's nice to change your Zoom name to your name and your organisation as well by clicking on the top three dots on your kind of picture screen just to get an idea of who is in the room. So um, today's theme is on energy which was, is one of the key components of any organization's efforts to reduce their carbon emissions. Um, but before we dive into the content, I'd like us to take a moment to consider our own energy. Because I'm aware that we all might be joining this event in different states. Perhaps you're experiencing Zoom fatigue after a couple of years now of these types of meetings. Um, perhaps you're feeling heavy from difficult things that are going on in the world, or maybe you're distracted by the various other things you um, need to get done today. So in order to bring your own en energy and presence to this time together, I'm gonna invite you all for just a moment to stand up if that feels comfortable, I'm gonna do it as well. Um, and I invite you to just move your body in whatever way feels good to you right now. So that could be stretching, stretching parts of your body that maybe feel a little tense. It might be doing some side to side swinging, which I really like. Or if you're really feeling energetic, you can like jump up and down, maybe do some star jumps. No one is watching you, everyone's just doing their own thing. So just, just move in whatever way feels nice. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone for participating. And yeah, please do now feel free to return to your seats. All right, <laughs> hopefully, yeah, hopefully that little bit of movement will just increase your, your energy a little bit so we can get the most out of this hour and a half together. Okay, so a quick introduction to the partnership for those who don't already know us. We are a network of over a thousand organizations in the Bristol, Bristol region, working together for a fast and fair response to the climate and nature crises. One of the ways we do this is by creating opportunities for organizations to learn from each other and tackle challenges together, which is what we're hoping to do here today. If your organization is not currently a member or you don't hear from us directly, please do sign up using the link that will be shared in the chat and it's totally free to do so. This workshop today is part of our Climate Action Programme, which is supported by Bristol City Council and Mount West, and it aims to help organizations of all sizes and sectors to reduce their carbon emissions. The programme offers a series of events such as this one, and we also create and signpost resources and provide opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning, such as the Climate Leaders Group. The best way to find out what the programme is up to is to sign up as a member, and you can find all the resources, including the recordings of previous events, in the link that will also be shared in the chat. So, on to today. The idea behind Intention to Action Connects is to provide a space for organisations to share challenges they're facing and explore these with other, other organisations. We've purposefully limited the number of attendees today to keep the group sizes small, as we hope this will en enable more in-depth explorations of your real life challenges than is often possible at larger events. We hope the discussions will be useful to you and your organizations, but we also hope to capture the tips and ideas from today and create a resource that can be shared with other organizations and, and the city more broadly. Before getting into those small groups, I'm really excited that we're going to hear from Eloise Cuff, Senior Energy Consultant at Anthesis, who will provide an overview of the challenges and opportunities for organizations around reducing emissions from energy. And then David Gray, Energy Supply Programme Manager at Bristol City Council, will talk about the impact of the current energy context, 
context for organizations. We're then gonna have some quick fire pitches of products and services that might be able to support, support you before moving into those small group discussions. All right, so that's enough from me. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Eloise. Thank you, Claire. Um, so just bear with me one second whilst I share my screen with you all. Um, please do let me know when you can see that. Great. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, looks good. Perfect. Okay, so um, there we go. So I'm Eloise Cuff, and yeah, as Claire mentioned, a senior energy consultant at Anthesis. So we are a global sustainability consultancy seeking to make a significant contribution to a world which is more resilient and productive. So we do this by working with cities companies and other organizations to drive sustainable performance um, and our teams span all aspects of sustainability from resource use and waste, energy systems, cities and decarbonization, supply chain, chemistry to agriculture and many more. Um, myself, I sit in the energy systems team. So we're made up of engineers, um, both mechanical, building services and electrical and consultants. So I sit on that consultancy side um, and support clients with energy and carbon compliance and also taking clients beyond compliance with their journey to become net zero. Um, our engineers then move these projects forward with real life implementation. We've got several offices in the UK and I'm based at our Bristol office which is on Baldwin Street so probably quite familiar to a lot of you. Um, I've got a pretty packed agenda today, but I'll be providing you with an overview of the challenges and opportunities regarding business energy use. Um, yeah, I've sort of pulled out interesting and hopefully key areas for each topic because um, there's a lot to cover. So apologies if I perhaps don't cover, cover something that you were hoping to hear about, but I'll be talking about green energy tariffs, improving energy efficiency, both in owned buildings and leased buildings and how to engage with landlords and building managers. I'll be talking about on-site generation and also some support that's available. It's important to recognise what the drivers are behind this topic. So I've pulled out a few key ones which are relevant, um, noting that there are also many other drivers and some of those will be unique to um, each business that's here today. So talking about energy in the business is very relevant given the rising energy costs we're seeing at the moment. Um, Realising efficiencies and keeping costs down is a really important step in managing those rising costs. And um, I believe that David, our next speaker, will be talking in more detail about the current energy context. Obviously, climate change is a, a key driver as well. Our planet is warming rapidly as carbon emissions soar, and we all need to be a part of the effort in tackling this. And to meet net zero targets, we need to decarbonize our buildings. Um, the 2020s are a, a key period in delivering a step change and reducing emissions from buildings and establishing the foundations of a pathway to net zero. So a key step is going to be moving away from burning fossil fuels for heating. Therefore, the future is likely to see a mix of low carbon technologies such as solar PV and heat pumps. So what is a green tariff? Almost every electricity supplier has a green tariff aimed at customers who want to buy renewable electricity. And these tariffs are labeled as, as green if some or all of the units of electricity that the customer buys are matched by units of electricity that have been generated from a verified renewable energy source such as a wind farm, solar array, or hydroelectric power station. But how green are these green tariffs? So this actually varies significantly. Um, so just to sort of explain some of the background that for every megawatt hour of renewable electricity generated, a renewable energy guarantee of origin certificate known as a REGO is assigned to it. But crucially, the certificate and the electricity don't have to be sold together. So this allows some electricity retailers to claim that they're selling renewable energy when really they're not sort of doing anything of the kind. Um, critics refer to this as greenwash, which is probably a term that you've all heard of. 
So essentially the end customer believes that they're supporting renewable energy generation, but in reality, their supplier may have just bought up unwanted Rego certificates and is using a market mechanism to undercut those suppliers which are genuinely green and they haven't invested in any um, renewable capacity at all. So the greenest tariffs that are available come from supply suppliers that buy those, uh, sorry, buy the renewable electricity and the accompanying uh, Rego certificates as well, directly from renewable ge generators such as UK Wind or Solar Farms um, via a mechanism called a power purchase agreement. So this never separates the Rego from the original units of generation. Um, and some green tariffs that are actually green are available via GE UK, Good Energy and Ecotricity. Moving on to improving energy efficiency. Um, so the questions that you'll see on this slide are ones that we get asked a lot and probably ones that many of you have asked yourself at times. Um, so I've managed to speak to a fair few colleagues in my business and sort of gather some thoughts together which will hopefully be helpful. Um, so I'll start by saying that it does come down to the contractual negotiation on lease renewal or acceptance so it's really important that you have these conversations with landlords or building managers at those times but some general thoughts of things to consider are the lease term so longer terms may be more amenable for sustainability considerations Cost share agreements, um, so building in cost sharing for sustainability improvements. Efficiency requirements, so requiring minimum levels of energy efficiency for the building. And also utilities transparency, so requiring submetering and data sharing for accurate tracking of your energy use and emissions. So I've added some links, which hopefully you'll get these slides after you can have a look on these. So um, I've linked to the UK Green Building Council. They've just got a whole host of information on their website. Um, so I'd really recommend just having a, a dig around on there. Also, the Clean Energy Buyers Association's commercial real estate principles can help guide conversations with landlords and building managers. And finally, MEES or the men, uh, minimum energy efficiency standards require landlords to let properties with a minimum of EPC band E before granting new tenancies. So that does link to guidance for landlords, but it is, um, it is useful and good to read for tenants as well. Um, some other general things to consider asking building managers and landlords as well around energy management are does the property have energy efficient lighting and controls in place um, or is the tenant able to install them themselves? Does the property have solar shading? Um, are there building fabric efficiency move, uh, measures in place such as double glazing, draft proofing and insulation? Um, do you have control over the timings of heating and cooling or the building management system controls? And if not, are you able to control radiators in the rooms? And some questions around renewable energy that you could ask are, does the landlord provide a 100% renewable electricity supplier contract? Um, and you now know that you can delve into that to see if it is actually green. Um, or do you have... Um, is permission and the ability to choose your own supplier contract with your chosen provider. Um, is there solar or wind generation available to the tenant or if not is the property suitable for other generation technologies and does the building utilize ground source or air source heat pump technology so just a few things there that that you can think of asking and building into those conversations. Um, so I've pulled out the commercial real estate principles here is I think they could be really useful. Um, so what they are is non-binding directional statements that are intended to guide and encourage collaboration between tenants and landlords to increase sustainable energy solutions in commercial buildings. Um, so both tenants and landlords can become signatories of the principles and this demonstrates support for the initiative. So commercial real estate tenants, they might use these principles to clarify and streamline energy management requests to landlords, um, resulting in a consistent demand signal that may simplify the asks for landlords. Um, tenants might also want to include the principles in a request for proposals and any other contract documents. And then landlords may use these principles to inform sustainable energy solutions that they offer to their tenants. 
So what can you do in your building if you own it or if you have control? Um, I've broken this into three steps. The first being around understanding your consumption. So data is, I cannot stress enough how important data is. Um, it can help you to understand your consumption and energy profile to inform the areas that you need to focus on. So meter reading should be taken monthly if you're able to. Um, and if you are in control of your utilities, you should always supply meter readings to your supplier. This ensures that your bill reflects your actual consumption instead of an estimate of your consumption. Um, and half hourly data may be available on request and this can give you an even more accurate picture of your profile. You might be able to identify trends or times in which consumption peaks um, that can then allow you to identify any issues. Also, carrying out a walk around of the building um, helps you to understand exactly what is consuming energy in your building. And again, this can help focus your attention where it's needed. So some common areas in non-domestic buildings where efficiencies can often be realized are is with lighting. So can you upgrade to more efficient LEDs or can you add controls such as daylight or PIR sensors? Uh, heating controls, are you able to adjust the timings and temperature on the boiler? If not, can you adjust the local control on the radiators in each room? Um, pipe work, so exposed pipe work running from radiators to boilers can be insulated, which is quite a cheap way actually to reduce heat loss and are very effective. So we've actually done this in our Bristol office. Um, we've yeah, sort of added like a foam covering to all of our pipe work. Uh, point of use. So if your hot water is just used for things like hand washing or washing up, um, point of use heaters may be better suited rather than using the mains. This removes all of the heat loss that you would see from pipe work um, throughout the building. And just generally they have lower energy consumption because they are just suited for the demand rather than being oversized like a boiler or something. Aerated taps, so this is a very low cost attachment and sometimes it is offered free from your water utility provider. Um, I know that Wessex Water do provide them for free. Um, obviously, I'm not sure about Bristol Water, um, but this can be added to taps to reduce the water flow, um, which in turn reduces the water usage and then that reduces the energy usage too. Solar film is a good one for hot offices. Um, it's just uh, like a, a film that you put on the windows and it can reduce the demand for cooling in the warmer months. Another classic one that we quite often see is that server rooms are typically cooled to too low a temperature. Um, we often see that they're set to around 18 degrees. So this means that when the temperature in the room is above 18, cooling um, will kick in, but they can actually be set to closer to 26 degrees um, and the equipment is fine and doesn't suffer from that. And then there's one that's a little bit more obscure, but just something that's quite interesting and hopefully will get you thinking. But if there's a lot of people in the office, um, people that are making lots of cups of tea and constantly opening and closing the fridge, like this will mean that the fridge is working really hard to keep cool and maintain a constant temperature. Um, so if you do work in a really busy office, you can always leave your milk out of the fridge because um, it can survive for a fair few hours in a day. So if you get through milk really quickly, that's quite a good one. Um, and then just general good housekeeping, really just turning monitors off um, and turning lights off. So whilst, you think your monitor might be in power saving mode just because it's on standby it is still consuming energy when it is in that state. And then moving on to the third point. So a robust plan in a business needs to be in place if business energy is to be addressed. So intention should come from senior management and staff should be engaged in these matters. It's no no use installing something like new heating controls if you don't know how to use them um, and you then use them incorrectly. So there needs to be an action plan and this should ideally be updated annually. Um, it could also be framed around a management system such as ISO 50001. Um, I've linked to that there. That's um, a management system for energy management specifically. 
And it's quite common as well to have environmental champions in the workplace. So typically an individual or a group of individuals that take responsibility on top of their job to ensure that things are being carried out as per the action plan. And they can also carry out walk around surveys as well. Moving on to on-site generation. So renewable energy generation, it's obviously very high on everyone's agenda um, as on-site generation brings the benefit of being self-sufficient. Solar PV is a, a popular option um, and despite recent increases in the cost of materials, they are generally becoming cheaper. So um, a company called JLL found that they are around 82% cheaper than when compared to a decade ago. Payback that we sort of would typically calculate in um, in our projects would be that you see a payback of around eight to 10 years, but given the recent price increases, this will lower that payback period quite significantly. And you could see, don't quote me on this, but you could see it being reduced to around three to five years. Um, but there are lots of things that you should consider um, when thinking of solar PV, for example, um, are you overshadowed or are you south facing? What is your energy usage profile? The sizing of the installation ultimately needs to be able to cope with demand and peak demand. Um, also, will you use solar all day and then connect to the grid at night? So you may wish to invest in storage to store any excess energy, or you can use a diverter to um, divert any surplus energy into heating or hot water. Roof condition is also another really important factor when considering renewables. Um, is it strong enough and structurally sound to cope with PV panels? Um, so the best thing to do would be to have a feasibility study carried out. Some challenges that we see as designers. So these photos have come from um, some of the engineers in our team and um, they've taken these on site visits and it's the type of challenges that we would often see when um, customers are looking to switch to on-site generation. Um, so heating emitters are often quite aged and difficult to access. Building fabric can be to a low standard in our buildings, a lack of cavity insulation. So for example, if you're looking to install a heat pump, um, it's really important that you have really sound and really good quality building fabric in place because you need to keep that building airtight for the heat pump to work and be effective and efficient. Um, I mentioned this previously but the structural strength of the roof for PV support quite often we see that it, it doesn't really have that strength. Um, existing plant and equipment can be challenging um, for example, heat pumps, again, it's quite often that you, you would have to um, upsize your radiators or the existing plant just might not be suitable for um, the new technology. And quite often there is a requirement to upgrade the site's main electricity supply. And then finally, this is a bit more um, <laughs> less familiar for me in my role, but drawings aren't always available. So that's a particular struggle for the engineers. And just a couple of slides on some support available. So keeping it current um, as per last week's spring statement to support the decarbonisation of non-domestic buildings, the government is introducing targeted business rate exemptions for eligible plants and machinery used in on-site renewable energy generation and storage and 100% relief for eligible low carbon heat networks that have their own rates bill. Um, and the statement announced that these measures will now take effect from April 2022, and this is a, a year earlier than previously planned. And then the Energy Technology List, um, or ETL, is a list created and updated monthly by the government's Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, or better known as BASE, um, which provide details of energy saving products for businesses in the public sector. Um, since its inception, the scheme has assessed nearly 60,000 products and now features 56 technology categories. So it's a really great place to go um, if you need more information on any of those. So just an idea of some of the categories. Um, so you've got air to air, air, -to -air energy recovery, um, automatic monitoring and targeting equipment, 
boiler equipment, heat pumps, heating, ventilation and air conditioning equipment, um, high speed hand dryers, lighting, pipework insulation, refrigeration equipment, solar thermal systems and many more. Um, and then I have linked to that list there as well. So you can have a look at that in your own time. Um, and that brings me to my last slide. So I'm, um, yeah, thank you for listening and very happy for you to email any questions and apologies. That was a bit of a whistle stop tour through <laughs> a lot of information. Thank you so much. Eloise, um, are you able to if you stop sharing your screen just so we can yes. see more people? Um, yeah, thank you so much. Wow, there was so much useful information in that in there. Um, and you won't have seen, but there were a fair few people in the chat sort of asking for the slides and <laughs> asking for the information to be shared. So I, I, I sure. sense that other people were finding it really useful as well. Um, yeah. I'm afraid everyone, because we're trying to fit a lot into a small time today, we, we don't have time for you to ask Eloise questions directly. But um, if you want to ask any questions in the chat, either Eloise can try and answer them now or we can kind of send them on afterwards. Um, so please um, feel free uh, to do that. Um, so thanks again, Eloise. And um, she's going to be sticking with us for the rest of, rest of the event. Um, so I'm now going to pass on to um, David Gray, who's the Energy Supply Programme Manager at Bristol City Council, to reflect on the impact of the current energy situation for organisations. Um, we really thought it would be remiss not to mention the current en energy crisis and how higher energy prices are impacting people at the moment. And we know this will be hitting organisations too, and is perhaps showing more than ever the multiple benefits of finding alternative sources of energy and, and reducing use. Um, so I will pass on to David. Thank you, Claire. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I say my name is David Gray. I'm the Energy Supply Manager for Bristol City Council. I used to have a £7 million a year energy bill. It's now considerably more than that. Um, it's been an interesting journey these last few months, and I just sort of want to take you through some of the highlights and some of the things you might uh, need to think about as you set out your own journeys. <clears throat> so just to give this some context, um, the, the sort of price rises we're seeing at the moment are exceptional. Uh, back in September, when our contracts were coming up for renewal, we thought this is getting a little bit expensive. Um, maybe we should just go for some short term contracts. It'll all be over by Christmas. Not quite. Um, so the, the, the level of price increases is unprecedented. Um, we, we've never seen anything like this and we're going to have to deal with it. So the issue we were facing is what do you do? when an enormous bill arrives, well, quite clearly, the first thing you do is panic. Once you've got that out of your system, you need a plan. Um, you, you've got to, whatever plan you come up with is going to be wrong, but at the very least, you, you've got to look at the, the sort of costs, the sort of expenses you're looking at, what you could do about it, come up with some sort of a plan. Our, our initial plan was what we called weather the storm. We go for three month contracts because we didn't want to lock in at what seemed like very high rates back in September, October. And then by Christmas, we go back to our normal long term fixed price contracts. OK, plan had to be adapted, but at least we had a plan, at least we could adapt it. Um, as Aloise touched upon, there are some silver linings. Um, th those business cases that you had sat on the shelf for years and years because you'd never afford to do them, the payback period could in some cases literally have halved. Uh, suddenly the, these projects become viable because of the sheer cost of energy. The other silver lining, which, which is um, perhaps a little unusual, is more management. Uh, this morning I was at our corporate leadership board. Um, now that's, that's a committee I don't normally get allowed anywhere near. In the past six months or so, uh, I've been regularly going to some very senior meetings, largely to explain why I'm trying to spend quite so much of the council's budget, 
Uh, but it's an opportunity to put energy on the senior management's agenda. This is something that's got their attention. Take advantage of it. So let's talk money. Um, absolutely, as I've always touched upon, you need to understand your bills. <clears throat> uh, I have some very interesting conversations with our finance staff as to why every building on the estate has got a different price for electricity. Uh, the, the, what, what makes up an electricity bill, particularly if you look at things like the non-commodity costs, some of these can be very complex and understanding what makes up your bill and what you can do about it. Um, in the past, we, we tended to have a consolidated tariff. We, we just basically have a single tariff that covers the wholesale price, the non-commodity charges. It's all lumped together in, into one single unit rate, which is easy for accounting purposes. But if you can move to a pass-through tariff and have all these charges broken out, there are things you can do about some of those charges depending when you use your energy. So, you know, for example, so between 5 and 7 p.m., there's an extra charge that applies. If you can reduce your energy demand during that period, it can make a difference the amount you're spending on your bill. Uh, absolutely, you've got to measure your demands. Um, Certainly on the electricity side, we've got a few gaps on the gas side, but we've got some fairly decent metering across our estate at whole building level. What we're now looking to do is see if we can go further than that and drill down into parts of buildings. Um, I've got some buildings that go through an enormous amount of energy overnight, and I don't fully understand why. If I can put in more sub-metering, I can figure out who's leaving what on overnight. Uh, forecasting. It is a challenge. Um, at the moment, uh, we're basically trying to work out what the future costs would be on the basis of uh, market intelligence. Uh, we're signed up to the Energy Information Centre. Other market intelligence uh, services are available. Uh, and we get now twice daily bulletins from them. So this morning, um, energy prices were up. And the fact that we're sort of monitoring these daily and trying to sort of work out where the trends are going shows how much of an impact this is having but at the moment sort of predicting future prices is, is is a best guess based on what we can see in the market it's very hard to say with any degree of certainty what the prices are going to be which then brings the question where are you going to find the money from uh, i'm fortunate in the council i don't have to worry about this I just go to the finance beat and say, I need an extra so many more million, find it for me. Uh, but somewhere in the council, somebody's had to make a hard decision. There's something we can't afford to do anymore because the energy bill's gone up. I can't tell you exactly what we've had to stop doing, but all your organizations are going to have to be making similar sorts of decisions. In order to afford this bill, what do we have to stop doing to find the enormous pile of money that the energy costs are now suddenly going through? On the supply side, um, as I mentioned before, we, we've, we've changed our tactics on our contracting. In the past, we've gone for fixed price contracts. We tend to go for sort of one or two years at a time. Our initial tactic was to go for even shorter contracts, which are enormously expensive, but that was to get us over the, this immediate problem that actually hasn't gone away. Um, but what we have done uh, on the gas, for example, we've moved away from fixed price contracts. We're now on flexible procurement. So with a fixed price contract, your price is set on the day the contract starts, whatever the market price happens to be that day. With flexible procurement, we're not making a single purchasing decision. We're spreading the purchase of gas over an extended period and making a number of smaller purchases and that helps reduce our cost risk. We're no longer gambling on what the price will be on one particular day. We're spreading that risk out over an extended period. It's a lot more complicated. Again, it's hard to explain to the finance people why I can't just tell them what the price is going to be next month. I say, well, you know, we haven't bought half the power we need next month. And so it makes accounting more difficult, but it, we, we will end up with a better price from doing it. Uh, Eloise touched upon green energy. Um, we, we've had a dilemma 
Um, on the gas side, um, we, we, we've always gone for a certain proportion of our gas supply to be green gas, but it's expensive. And we've had to make some hard decisions. Uh, it costs an extra penny a kilowatt hour. If you go through enough kilowatt hours, that's a lot of money. And so we've had to scale back on the amount of green gas that we're buying because we just simply can't afford it. But I think the real answer is to stop using gas in the first place. And we, we have plans to do that. And then, as Eloise mentioned on the, the, the green tariffs, um, the picture uh, in the middle on the right there is the wind farm owned by our current energy supplier. <clears throat> when we're running these tenders, we, we actually rank our suppliers based on how green their electricity is. So if a supplier owns their own farm and is generating their own energy, that scores very highly. If they're buying Regos directly from the generator, that scores highly. If they're just simply buying Regos, if, if they're, they're just doing a carbon offset, that scores much lower when we're running a tendering exercise. So we, we have that now as a quality criteria in our supply tenders. <clears throat> and the other thing that's changing is not all our energy is going to come from the grid. Um, we, we, the, the picture bottom right there is a solar array on the rooftop of my office building. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively small array, um, but anything I can get from that immediately uh, saves me 10 pence a kilowatt hour in non-commodity charges I don't have to pay. Anything that you can generate and produce behind the meter means you're avoiding a whole bunch of extra charges that the, the grid electricity automatically comes with. Uh, we're developing options, what's called sleeving. Um, the council owns a couple of large wind turbines and a solar farm out at Avonmouth. We're working on a mechanism whereby we can route that power directly to our buildings. Well, so it, it's done virtually through a mechanism called sleeving. That decarbonizing our energy supply, but it also makes us far less exposed to, to grid prices and to market fluctuations. And I think this will be a growing trend. So I think if you look at your neighbours, are they generating surplus power? Have they got waste heat? Um, in about a week's time, we're going to be announcing the, um, or the asking for the cabinet to approve um, the, the preferred bidder for the City Leap initiative. And one of the things that that initiative is looking at is developing the local energy market. So what, what we're hoping to develop within Bristol is more of this exchange of power. So uh, I've got an array on my roof. I can sell you my surplus directly rather than selling it to the grid. Um, I've also now got two buildings on the district heating system. So my office building doesn't have a gas bill anymore. I now have a heat bill. It's a, of a similar size to the gas bill, but I don't have a gas bill anymore. And as, as the district heat network expands and more of the council buildings come within range of it, I can get more and more of my buildings moved across to the district heating system. On the demand side, absolutely don't forget the basics. People use the posters, they fade into the background. You have to constantly remind people you know, energy is expensive, turn it off. Um, the business cases, as I mentioned before, yes, uh, some of the, the payback on those has transformed. But what we've changed over the last year or so, we, we've changed our tactics. In the past, we were very much going for sort of the fast payback, the, the low hanging fruit. So they got a lot of LED lighting projects. They're quick and easy to do. They're very easy to get approved because the payback's tremendous on them. The problem is that the, the hard to fund the measures, you know, things like sort of interior wall insulation, you can never afford to do them. The, the payback just never stacks up. So what we're now doing is, is more of a whole building approach, saying like, what are all the measures that could be done within this building and averaging them out to come up with a balanced payback so that some of the, the quick and easy payback measures help fund the more difficult to fund measures. So I'd say have a look at your building as a whole rather than just individual technologies. <clears throat> uh, the government shifted away from loan schemes for the public sector. They, um, they've very much now gone for grants and with a particular emphasis on heat decarbonisation. Um, we've, we've not done too badly out of what's called the public sector decarbonisation scheme. Um, we've got a bit of money out of that, 
some of our um, other neighboring, uh, other local authorities got more than we did. And I think the key message there, you've got to understand the scheme and the rules. So if somebody's offering you free money, that's great. Figure out what they want you to do to get that free money, understand it and get your bids in early. And if you look at your current energy demand, it's going to change. So I mentioned we've got buildings moving across from gas to district heating. The buildings that aren't on the district heating network, um, we will get rid of the gas boilers, we'll put in heat pumps. So my electricity demand, despite my best efforts to save energy, is going to go up. That's why it's important to have an affordable electricity supply. It's important to have a zero carbon electricity supply, because in the future, I'm going to change the types of energy that I'm using. So I hope that's giving you sort of flavor of the journey we've been on and the journey still to come. Amazing. Thanks loads, David. Um, yeah, again, just super interesting to hear about your experience over the last few months. I imagine it's been a stressful time. Um, but as you said, perhaps there are some silver linings um, as well. And I'm, I'm sure there was a lot there uh, for people to think about. Um, again, I'm afraid there aren't there aren't isn't time to ask David questions directly. But if if you do have anything, um, please do put it in the chat and, and we can send it on to David or, or um, he can see if he can answer it now. Um, OK, I know that there's been a lot of information already. Um, but but just bear with us for a few more minutes and then we'll um, be able to get into smaller groups and, and have discussions. Um, but first, we're going to hear five pitches from organisations or initiatives um, who are going to share some of the services and tools that might be able to support you and your organisation. Each one is going to get 60 seconds. Um, and in order to keep time, I am going to do this if anyone's like, um, going over so do do be warned um, it's only to give you a brief idea um, of, of the offering and all of the pictures will be able to share some contact details or more information in the chat so if you wanted to follow up um, you can do so um, so I think we'll get started with with Will from Bristol Energy Co-op over to you Will Right. Hi, thanks, Claire, everyone. So uh, I work for Bristol Energy Cooperative. We are a community energy organisation that's been running since 2011, developing all sorts of renewable energy projects through community share raises. Um, one thing in particular that we'd like to do more of is community-owned solar PV across the city. Um, this would help us deliver our community benefit schemes. We've, we've enabled over £300,000 of community benefit funds to date. And it's a very uh, useful model for a lot of organisations in that there's no capital cost. Uh, you have reduced electricity bills. We handle all of the feasibility and project management side of things. And crucially, you get a bit more certainty over how much you're going to be paying for your electricity. So uh, please let me know if that could fit in with your environmental and social targets. We'd love to hear from you. Lovely, thank you, Will. Um, and now over to James at Stark. Hi guys, just hurriedly unmuting myself. Um, so it's just gonna be a quick run for of the what, who, how and why of Stark. Stark's founded in 1981 and delivers independent best in class services to help organizations of all kinds from Cornwall County Council to Aldi and Royal Mail, manage their energy better. Um, how we do that? We empower organisations to better manage their energy through specifically data and analytics. And we do this by taking granular data from gas, electricity, and even water meters and aggregating into a cloud-based online analytics and visualizations platform. So we can work with your existing metering equipment or use our nationwide team of engineers to install metering equipment to measure usage ourselves. And why we do it, organisations use our online platform to understand how much energy they're using and when. Um, our platform is able to help organisations compare and contrast energy usage across multiple sites simultaneously, to see where and when energy is being used. Particularly useful to see where it's being used, for example, when the um, buildings or properties are unoccupied. Additionally, the plat platform can also automatically alert organisations when energy usage is outside of key parameters. 
it's a text and save, for example, if people are coming in and using things at night when they shouldn't be, or um, too much energy gets used in a given period of time. Finally, as we shift to rapid, um, as we rapidly shift to electric vehicles, um, our platform can incorporate charging data from our own EV charging solution so that organizations can understand how their scope one emissions have now moved into their scope two emissions. Um, if there's anything of any of that is of interest, please uh, reach out to me. Lovely, thank you, James. Um, and now we'll uh, move to Holly, who's going to talk about the green business grants that Weka are offering. I'll meet myself. Uh, hi guys, I'm Holly. I work for uh, on the Green Business Grant Scheme at Weka. Um, hopefully you can see my screen, um, but it's basically a grant scheme where businesses can receive 50 to 80% of their total costs towards um, an energy saving improvement project, and they can get up to £15,000 towards that. Um, and the sorts of things that we funded in the past are commonly uh, solar PV, uh, air source heat pumps, double glazing, LED lighting, um, lots of things like that. Um, and as part of the scheme, businesses can also get a free carbon survey, which is a report which gives them lots of useful information about their business and the energy saving improvements that they could um, they could make. Um, so for businesses to be eligible for the scheme, uh, they need to be classed as a, a small and medium sized enterprise. Um, they need to be based in the West of England and they need to be uh, VAT registered and trading at above £85,000. Um, so the this window of the grant scheme uh, closes in May. And so if anyone's interested, um, you need to get in touch with us before then. Um, and I'll put I'll put some details and useful links uh, in the chat if anyone is, is interested or knows anyone that might be. Wonderful, thank you, Holly. Um, and we will now move on to Simon from uh, Greener Energy Futures. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. So, Green Energy Futures is we are a small consultancy. We help organisations do everything in these four quadrants. We help you understand your carbon emissions, not just energy. We do energy in buildings and so on, but carbon across the board. Uh, and uh, we then help you to find funding to implement projects. Sometimes that's Weka. We've helped exploit the uh, the Weka grants. Sometimes it's uh, sources like Bristol Energy Co-op's grant. Uh, sometimes these other sources as well. We've raised four million of funding for our clients in the last year and a half. Uh, so we find the carbon and the energy. We find ways of, of paying for projects to, to help get rid of those. We then want to run workshops to help get the staff on board with those projects because it's not just about technology, it's about behavior. And then we deliver the reductions by working with partners around. You'll see some of the organizations we work with, Avon Fire Rescue, uh, Experian, the credit agency, Jeff Way, or a local construction business and MEI or a charity. So we deal with all sorts of different size organizations and are happy to help you save money on energy and hit your net zero targets. If you just Google greener energy futures, you'll find us and then my contact details will across the bottom there. Lovely, thank you, Simon. Um, and last but not least, we're going to hear from John at the at Bristol City Council, who's going to share some information about heat networks. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. It's just loading for me. Ah, uh, yes. Can okay. Now. <clears throat> Good. Um, so, if you're wondering uh, how your building is going to decarbonize, a heat network could a heat network connection could well be the answer for you. Um, uh, heat network is any system for distributing heat generate, oh, sorry, uh, gener generated uh, for, um, uh, from any location across a, a range of heating uh, supplies. So it's agnostic to the type of heating that it uses. Um, uh, it, it typically replaces gas bo boilers in existing buildings, uh, but also, also connects up with, with new developments. Uh, and that gas boiler is replaced with a heat exchanger, uh, which forms a connection to your building's uh, heating uh, system. Uh, Bristol City Council has now been uh, building heat networks for several years. Um, we uh, last Thursday, however, um, finally turned on our first water source heat pump, which would be the largest in England, at Castle Park, taking heat uh, from the floating harbour, distributing it around to local buildings. 
So that's a very exciting milestone. Um, on the left is an area where we expect to eventually build heat networks. It's estimated that a heat network connection will be the lowest cost, lowest carbon heating source for around 68,000 buildings across the city, with individual heat pump systems being the optimum for the other 90,000 uh, or so. The areas on the right are the areas where we're currently working. So we've got two live networks in Old Market in Redcliffe. Uh, we've got one in construction in Bedminster, another one signed off in Temple, and then four other areas where we're doing feasibility or master planning. Um, and final slide, here in yellow, you can see everything that we've constructed, uh, hopefully by the end of next year. In pink, you'll see all the pipe routes we have mapped out for the future as part of the feasibility studies. Um, so if your business is in a large building anywhere in these areas or near these pipes, uh, please get in touch. We're likely to be the best bet for decarbonisation of your building. So it should hopefully be part of your plan going forward. And let's look on Teti Thompson again. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks to all our pitchers. And some of you went a little bit over 60 seconds, but it was also useful. Um, I was I, I just allowed it. Um, so, yeah, thank you to, to all of you for pitching. Um, it's really useful to hear about these different schemes and services that are available. Um, I know that some of you might be leaving at this point. So just thank you for coming today and contributing. And we'll make sure these details are shared um, afterwards as well.